Hi, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Continuing in our Message to a Messed Up Church series, today's message is entitled, Jesus is Enough, and we'll be hearing from guest pastor Monty Patton. If you want to grab your Bible or Bible app, we'll be studying 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Now, here's Pastor Monty Patton. Again, I am so glad to be here with you today. My name is Monty Patton, and uh, I, am, I am pumped. I have been a fan of this church from afar for a long time, for a long time. I live in Peoria, Arizona. Maybe you've heard of it. I don't know. Maybe you've heard of it, okay? And I want to welcome also the, uh, our faith family down in Parker. Um, we come from, um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your pastor. I mean, huge fan of Reuben. Um, he, he's a good friend, and he takes my phone calls. That's one of the reasons why I love him. All right? Um, we were driving here from Peoria. Had to go through Parker. Saw the signs that says, pretty good jerky. I don't know if you've ever seen that sign that says, pretty good jerky. Not good, not great jerky, not world famous jerky, but pretty good jerky. And so, of course, we had to stop in and get us some pretty good jerky. And you know what? It was pretty good. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. Hey, I'd like for you to do me a favor and open up your Bibles, please, the book of 1 Corinthians. We've been studying as a church this book of Corinthians for a little bit, for about a couple, three weeks, and we're going to continue um, throughout the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. And um, for those of you that are brand new to this Jesus walk, or maybe you've been on vacation and, and just, you know, haven't, like, let me get you caught up, okay, really quick. Let me get really caught up, okay? Now, there was a guy named Paul that was a persecutor of the church. I mean, he went around putting people in prison. Some of them even died because of the persecution. And he was going between uh, Jerusalem and Damascus to arrest and uh, bring uh, prisoners back to Jerusalem. And on that road, Paul had a a face-to-face encounter with the living Jesus, a risen Jesus. And he confronted him of his sin. Paul then gave his life to Jesus, and this radical persecutor of the church became a radical follower of Jesus, and then began to actually start churches all over what we know as Asia Minor. And uh, one of those churches was in a church in a community called Corinth. Corinth, a very wealthy city, a very transient community. Uh, the world kind of passed through Corinth. It had all kinds of uh, wonderful things about the city. And as Paul has uh, been uh, starting this church, and, um, and he left the church eventually to start other churches, he would write back to this church uh, letters uh, to kind of talk about some of the issues that the church had. This church had some issues. And so Paul had to write him a little letter, kind of help him straighten out some of those issues. And so that's where we're at when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And Paul addresses an issue that speaks right to you and I's life, and that is, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough? Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. He says, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mysteries of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to do, know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I'm sure that all of you know that uh, it's easy to become socially influenced, right? You turn on Instagram, you turn on Twitter, and that's all you see is ads. I mean, you think about it, um, those ads are meant really to uh, influence you to, dry, to, to buy stuff with, um, that you really don't need with money that you don't have to impress people that you don't like. <laughs> Am I right? That's the objective of those ads. And they try to influence you to do so. And all of us, to be honest, um, have been influenced by somebody else. David Johnson, one of um, Pastor Chad and I's really good friends. Chad's actually gone on mission um, over in Africa with David. And and we're all really good friends. But David and Diana's wife and Nancy, my wife and I, um, we we were on vacation with one another. And uh, Pastor Chad goes on mission, I go on vacation. Okay, that should tell you something about the spirituality of the guy in front of you, all right? But anyway, so we're, we're out on vacation, and, uh, and, and uh, David's wife shows a video that they had just purchased a bouncy house that they could put in their living room for their grandchildren. Picture it, a bouncy house 
in your living room for your grandchildren. I'm watching that video and I'm going, this is the most horrible thing I could think of. My wife looks at that and says, that's amazing. We need this. <laughs> right? Little do I know, Amazon.com. <laughs> right? <laughs> Off we go. Now we got ourselves a bouncy house for our living room. Our kids come over. We have to move all the furniture out, you know, move as far as we can so our kids can do high dives off of this bouncy house. It's just a matter of time before one of them hits the ceiling fan, like that, okay? It's just a matter of time. It's very easy to be influenced. Paul knew that, and Paul was concerned that people were getting influenced wrongly. And so he wanted to kind of address that issue a little bit about influence, because Paul decided that the best course of action was not to get into the fray of debate or even about Paulish speaking, but it was to get back to the basics that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. And so he says in this passage, in this chapter two, that Jesus is enough first in who he is. Because Paul says he is Christ. Now Paul's not interested in discussing men's ideas or insights, even his own or someone else's. He decided he was going to proclaim nothing but Jesus Christ. The crucified, risen, redeemed Jesus Christ. The foundation of his message was going to be from that point on that Jesus as the divine Savior. The Bible talks a lot about Jesus, of course. Describes him as the Almighty. That Jesus is our advocate. That Jesus is the bread of life. That he is the good shepherd. That he is the cornerstone of our life. That he is the counselor when we need wisdom. He is the image of of the invisible God, that he is the head of the church, the lawgiver, that Jesus is the lion of Judah, the mighty one. He is the prince of peace, the redeemer. He is the resurrection and the life, and the Bible says that he is truth. When you come here to this church, you are blessed to have a great pastors that spend hours praying over the scripture, studying over the scripture, and preparing on how to deliver the scripture to you. Okay, on Monday, they don't get on their favorite AI program and go, give me a sermon, and it pops out, okay? They actually spend time preparing to speak to you today because that's what you deserve. You need a pastor who's going to not give you his opinions about the latest political issues or world events. This, your pastors are not going to hear teach you about other religions so that you be equipped to debate them. I mean, you know how to... Um, how to uh, um, know counterfeit money is counterfeit? By studying real money, okay? When you study what is truth, then you know what is false. That's what happens. And your pastors get up every Sunday and they preach the word and they study the word and they proclaim the word so that you will know that Jesus is the Christ. So Paul says, I not only is is Jesus enough in who he is? Jesus is also enough in what he did. Because it says that Christ crucified Jesus, the healer of the sick, the restorer of families, the deliverer of the demoniac, the feeder of the 5,000, the calmer of the sea is the substitutionary sacrifice for my sins and for yours. He substituted our failures for his perfection. He covered our sins with his sacrifice. And the Bible says that all of us have sinned. Let's just take a little poll. How many of y'all have sinned lately? The rest of you are liars. Okay? Hey, tell you that, you just are. All right? I'll be honest with you. I sinned today. I got behind a trucker that wasn't going fast enough. Okay? Now, don't, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about, right? I'm going... I think I can make it, right? And so I pull over on the left side and I go a little bit for a little bit faster than what the speed limit suggests, right? <laughs> Suggest. My wife's going, there's another car, there's another car, there's another car. Calm down, we're gonna be fine. Gah! Like that. Uh, okay. All of us, the Bible says, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what a sin is. I mean, come on, right? You know what it is. It's missing the mark of God's plan for your life. And all of us have done that. 
And the Bible says that Jesus loved us enough that he died on the cross as a substitutionary atonement for your sin and my sin, your mistake and my mistake. That's what Jesus has done. Romans 5, 8, 6 through 8 says this. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good man, perhaps someone may even dare to die. But God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. Amen? Amen. Man, I love that. Now, Paul was so concerned that he shared the message of Jesus that he goes on to say in verse 3, I came to you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. Paul's concern was, very simple, that if he could talk you into something, someone else could talk you out of something. That's what he was concerned about. He goes, I didn't come to you with eloquence of speech. I'm not a great speaker. I didn't come to you with these persuasive words of wisdom. I wanted to come to you as humble as possible because reality is I wanted you to see Jesus. That's what he said. That's what Paul's concern was. Paul understood that there were better speakers out there. Now, I'll be honest, when your pastor uh, asked me some months ago whether or not I would come and, and preach at this great church, I got a little scared. First I said yes, and then I said, Lord, what have I done? Okay, I, um, I, we laughed about it. I'm not used to preaching to large crowds, okay? I preach at some of the best double wides in Arizona, okay? And so uh, I'm not, and so I was going, this church is alive. You know, I'm going, oh my goodness, I, what, what's, what, Lord? And I, I started getting a little fearful, getting a little intimidated because you, you guys hear great preaching every Sunday, and I was a little scared about that. And so, and, 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 and Paul says, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Because it's not about your eloquence. It's not about your wisdom. Really, you know what? Instead of being so stressed out about it, why don't you lean on me to do the talking? That's what he said. That's what he's going. Now, I guarantee that every time your pastor gets up to preach, that day he says a little prayer. It's something like this. Lord, I've studied. Lord, I've prayed. Lord, I've prepared. But none of that matters if you aren't going before speaking into the hearts of people. Lord, please make it not about me, but about you. I tell you, you do not want a pastor that gets up behind the pulpit and goes, God, I got this. <laughs> All right? You don't want a pastor that does that. How do I know? Because I've known your pastor for 25 years. I knew him when we both had dark hair. <laughs> okay, that's how long ago it's been, right? So Paul wanted his words to be a demonstration of the Spirit's power. He says in verse 6, We do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. And to be honest with you, the, the wisdom of this world is coming to nothing. The wisdom of this world says you are what you accumulate. The Spirit says, you're more than what you accumulate. The wisdom of this world says that your mistakes define you. But the Bible says, the Spirit says, that you are remarkably and wonderfully made in the image of God. He determines what defines you. And he has a plan for your life. The wisdom of this world says, I'm living my truth. <laughs> Maybe you've heard that. I've heard young people say that. I'm living my truth. And they say it like that too, with their hands out like that. I'm living my truth. I'm trying to be cool like them. I'm living my truth. And I go, what are you talking about? What is your truth? The problem with your truth is that your truth keeps changing according to your whims. And if it can change according to your whims, it ain't truth. All right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I used the word ain't. If I'm from Oklahoma, that's okay. All right? 
Education wasn't a priority where I came from. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, so let me get on with it, okay? Here's a pers- if I can let the wisdom of this world shape me in evaluating truth, or am I going to let the Spirit of God shape my knowledge of truth? The wisdom of this world is always changing. The truth about Jesus is always truth. The same truth that was 2,000 years ago is the same truth for today. And guess what? It's going to be the same truth 2,000 years from now. It's the same truth. So Jesus is enough in who he is. Jesus is enough in what he did. And lastly, the Spirit reveals that Jesus, that the Spirit reveals that Jesus is enough. He says in verse 7 and 8, On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery. A wisdom God predestined before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because if they had known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. The powers of this earth thought that they could get rid of Jesus, that it would just be over. We would have to worry about this movement ever again if we could just get rid of Jesus. Satan thought that Calvary was God's greatest defeat, yet we know that it turned out to be God's greatest victory in Satan's defeat. And that God had already predestined a path for us to be forgiven. He says in verse 10 and 11, Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except his spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Isn't that true? Only a, only a person really knows what a person is thinking. I mean, you think about it, okay? Only you know what you're really thinking. When you came in tonight, um, someone may have said to you, how you doing? And you probably looked straight in their eyes and said, fine, <laughs> fine. But things aren't necessarily fine, right? I mean, You may have yelled at your spouse, get in the car, we're going to be late. Get in the car! (gasps) Right? Um, You may have, uh, like like my family, we go to to my church, and my wife got in to get in the car, and we we park, and and I may not be exactly in between the white lines, (gasps) okay? I'm close. I'm within them, but not perfectly within them. And she gives me the business, (gasps) okay? And I've got friends now that when I park, they take pictures and they send to her for her to give me the business, <laughs> right? And so, you know, uh, it may not be fine. Last week, um, I was driving to church, last preaching at a different, another church, wonderful church uh, in Queen Creek, um, and, uh, um, and, and I went, and man, first thing, they said, how you doing? And, and to be honest with you, I wasn't fine. Um, a week ago today, we found out that my two-year-old granddaughter is a type 1 diabetic. She had been rushed to the hospital. She was in the hospital. Her life will be changed forever. And to um, be honest, I wasn't fine. But when people asked me, how are you doing? I looked at him and said, I'm fine. And guess what? You may not be fine today. Life may have hit you hard this week, and you're not fine. So, really, who knows the mind of a person except them? But in the same way, who knows the mind of Christ except the Spirit of Christ? The Spirit of God knows everything about, the, about Jesus, and He instructs us. He helps us. He reveals everything we need to know about Jesus. When we became a Jesus follower, the Spirit of God opens our hearts and our eyes to the truth of God's Word. And it becomes, as the psalmist said, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And it becomes a lamp into my path. That's what the Spirit of God does. Verse 9 says, But as is written, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor human heart is conceived. God is prepared for those who love him. Verse 12, now we have not received the spirit of this world, but the spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what he has freely 
given to us by God. The word freely means without restriction or interference. Other words this, the Spirit of God reveals to us things we can't even imagine about God. We can't even imagine all that God has in store for us, both in this life and in the life to come. The Bible tells us that he'll create a new heaven and a new earth, and that one day we'll all live with Jesus forever if we've given our lives to him. In between now and then, the Holy Spirit comforts us and guides us. The Holy Spirit teaches us how we can live a life of freedom, how we can forgive ourselves and how we can forgive others. He's taught us what real joy is all about, and he allows us to see beauty in HD. A few weeks ago, I hiked the Grand Canyon. I love hiking the Grand Canyon. I don't know if you've been in the Grand Canyon. People from all over the world come to see our big ditch. <gasps> okay? I mean, it's beautiful. I went and hiked the Grand Canyon. A friend of mine called me and said, do you want to go camping down in the canyon? I said, yeah, I want to go. So I drove up on a Thursday. We hiked down on Friday, spent the night, and we came back up on Saturday. And I went to Plateau Point. And if you're ever at the Grand Canyon, you can look over the canyon. You can see Plateau Point. It's the point that has a little trail going to it. It's about four and a half miles down there. It's not that bad. And so when, it's, never, it's never bad going down, okay? <laughs> Whoever tells you, oh, no, it's a, just a walk in the park. You have to come out of that park, okay? <laughs> so you get down to the end of that thing, go down, uh, and, and, and uh, I'm by myself. I'm just enjoying the beauty, watching the California condors kind of flying around me, looking at me like they're hungry, <laughs> okay? Um, so I'm looking at that, and... Um, and, I look at the, and, and I'll be honest, I'm, like I said, I'm by myself. And one of my many faults is I have a tendency to eavesdrop. Okay? Judge me if you will. But I'm not going to change. Okay? So I'm eavesdropping on these two young ladies that their first encounter with the Grand Canyon. And it was a little hazy. It wasn't, I mean, you can still see all the beauties of the canyon. I mean, you still see the greens and the blues. And the, you can see the, the Colorado River coming through the canyon. It's, it's still, it's just gorgeous. But it's a little hazy. And, and one of the girls says, you know, it's a little hazy. And, she, and the other girl goes, hey, you need to look, them through, look through these new glasses that I bought. And she took off her glasses and she gave them to her friend. Her friend puts them on and goes, wow, I see things so much clearer. I see the blues and the greens. I see the reds and I see the river. It is beautiful. The canyon is beautiful. That's exactly what the Spirit of God does in your life. Now, I'll be honest with you. Life can be beautiful without Jesus. I'm not going to lie to you. It can be good. But it can't be in HD. Okay? It can't be beautiful. It can't be all that. God's got so much for you. So much more for you. And when we give our life to Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus gives us his spirit and the spirit reveals to us who Jesus is so that we can see life in high definition. We can see the colors that God has created. That's what he's providing for you and what God's providing for me if we'll just give our lives to Jesus. He concludes by giving this little caveat in verse 15, 14, 15. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from the God's Spirit because they're foolish to him. And he's not able to understand it since they are evaluated spiritually. A spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by others. This is what he's saying. Don't expect most people to understand or to even approve your decision to be a Jesus follower and that Jesus is enough. By you coming to church on a Saturday night. Your friends that don't know Jesus look at you and go, that's just silly. For those of you that say, you know what? I'm willing to sacrifice my wishes and my dreams for other people for the sake of the gospel. They look at you and go, you're just silly. For those of you that are going, you know what? The Lord tells, tells me that I need to be a tither, that I need to be a giver, that I need to be sacrificial. We got things to do, the kingdom to expand, missions to go on. Your friends look at you and say, that's just silly. 
And the reason why they say it's just silly, that's why they think about it just silly. They don't understand your commitment to Jesus, your commitment to love Lake Havasu, your commitment to love Parker. The reason why they think it's silly is because they don't have Jesus yet. <laughs> yet. Now this church prays constantly that those that don't know Jesus yet will experience Jesus so they can live a life in HD. And while they may not understand, our prayer is that you give your life to Jesus so that you can understand and see what life is all about. You look around at your friends and go, why are they happy? Why do they have joy even when bad stuff happens to them? It's all about Jesus. Our prayer is that today you experience that Jesus is enough. That's our prayer for you. Can we pray together again? Lord Jesus, I thank you that we've had a, an opportunity to look what you have to tell us today in this letter to the church of Corinth. That's really a letter to the church in Lake Havasu. That's really a letter to the church in Parker. It's really, Father, a letter to the church in Glendale and all over the world. I think that you remind us that it's not about eloquence of speech. It's not about the wisdom of this world. It's all about the power of the Spirit. And Father, I pray that your Spirit will touch the hearts of people that don't know you yet. That will draw them, Father, to you. Father, call them to you. And that, Father, they can't do anything else but say yes to you. We pray so hard, Father, that people will know you. And those of us that are Jesus people, who have given our hearts and our lives to you, Father, I pray that we'll never forget that you're enough. You're enough for our problems. You're enough for our concerns. You're enough for our past. You're enough for our future. You, Jesus, are enough. We give you praise and glory for the decisions that are going to be made today and throughout this weekend. In your name, amen. If today's message spoke to you and you would like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so by visiting our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, and subscribe to the Word for the Day daily devotionals. That's it for today. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.